be back, although most of you don't know I was gone. So, anyways, um, we're gonna have one on vacation. I've gone a couple weeks, and before I left, we had uh, been doing um, offering devotions on where the Lord. I felt the Lord was leading me to take lessons from the parables. Uh oh. And I get myself situated here. Uh, the first parable we looked at was in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26, where Jesus referred basically to himself uh, in a parable as a, as a grain of wheat and talking about if it falls to the ground and, and dies, it produces much grain. And then we looked at some scriptures uh, relating to seed and harvest and the multiples of return spoken of in scriptures. And the difference between what we read today from Matthew 13 and from uh, John 6, as I mentioned, is that as I understood the scripture, Jesus was referring to himself and what the outcome of his death would provide, that being salvation for many. And then he offered a call to serve and follow him. Well, most of us are familiar with the parable of the sower. Um, and this one is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 and 19. And we're going to read that. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. So also this parable is in Mark 4 and Luke 8, uh, where it's recorded. And Jesus is referring to the seed as those who hear the word regarding the kingdom of God. So there's a difference between um, how seed is, is meant and used here. Well, with that point being made, I want to focus on uh, verse 22 of Matthew 13. This is in the area where um, Jesus is explaining the parable to the disciples. Now verse 22 reads, Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So we have to be careful to guard our hearts and minds against the cares of this world and misguided thinking about the importance of worldly riches. Why? Because if we let the wrong influences and priorities of worldly possessions and cares become more important than, than God's true riches, then we become unfruitful. That's worth repeating again. If we let the <coughs> wrong influences and priorities of world possessions and cares become more important than godly true riches, we become unfruitful. And by unfruitful, that means we bear no fruit. We're like the fig tree uh, that Jesus looked to in Mark 11. And this is a very interesting uh, scripture. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And we know what Jesus did. Verse 14, And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And we know the result of that action, because when they returned back out of the city, they saw the tree that it withered up and it was dead. So the point is, we don't want to be unfruitful, because we see what the end is. We see that it's an end of death. But the good news for this message is giving to the Lord as we do today is never going to be considered unfruitful to Him. No service, no gift, no, no matter how small, how big, um, in His name is never, it's never going to be overlooked. It will all be remembered and rewarded by Him. So from Matthew 13, whatever thorns in our life that take our attention and focus away from serving the Lord, let's put them aside and reprioritize, or as Joan says, let's hit the override or the reset button so that our, our heart is properly focused. So let's pray as we give today. And if you want to write a check today, you can make it out to the Upper Room Fellowship. We have some envelopes, and um, but let's pray before we give. Father, we desire to be good ground and that your word would take root so that we would be 
so that we would do good works yes. that are uh, that are what you want and that are what your will is for our lives. Yes. So, Father, we give cheerfully. We give sacrificially. We give to you. We give to the ministry that it would do your will. Father, that others would come to you through it. Others would be set free, free through it. That others would be healed and, and born again through it, Father. So as we give today, we thank you for what you have given. And we desire not to be unfruitful, fruitful, but fruitful for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We get started recently. Um, this just came, um, a DVD. Yes. It's based on the last conference we did. Um, some of the speakers was... Bob and Lori Colley and John Dickman and Angel Edmonston and yours truly. So uh, it's kind of based on my book, What Was I Thinking? Yep. And uh, we get uh, a number of people respond that they re received healing at the conference. So um, this one's for George. Available anywhere except through the ministry at this point. So we'll see where it goes. So the 3rd of July is always... Um, to me, personally, a significant um, moment because 15 years ago, this day, I was dead. And, um, you know, the testimony on the app, I'm not going to go through it again, but... So I'm always very grateful every day I wake up and think how awesome God is. That He can do anything, nothing at all is impossible with Him. It's just absolutely incredible. So as America gets ready to celebrate tomorrow, um, because of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, yeah. um, 4th of July. I remember um, John and I were living in England and uh, we went down to London to see some friends and, and we were in some restaurant and it was, uh, we all celebrate the 4th in, you know, in England, in, in America, we celebrate the 4th. And I told, them, I told the American guys that we celebrate Benedict Arnold Day in England on the 4th. <laughs> I can't believe somebody would ask me that, you know, really? So, but according to um, some research in the 56 minutes signed the Declaration of Independence, it appears that possibly only 16% were really high level secret society connected to Freemasonry and Illuminati stuff. Um, the majority were mainstream Christians. They were like a lot of... Uh, uh, Anglicans and Congressionalists and Presbyterians, you know, very few um, Quakers and the rest of them, but um, it occurred to me there's this guy named Haman, Haman Solomon, of anybody knows about, is a Jewish businessman, he was Polish born, and he came over during the Revolutionary War, and he um, sorted out helping convert the French loans into cash with a bill of exchange with a guy named um, Robert Morris. And this is the way that he helped um, George Washington finance the, the war. Now, that's interesting when you realize that, because here's this Jewish guy that comes along and basically helped finance the beginning of America. Genesis 12, 3 says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and they shall all families of earth be blessed. So I think that's a real good factor why America has been very blessed for a long, long time. I should probably take this off here. Hang on a second. Anyways, I tend to start sounding like Mr. Professor if I just stand here all the time. Okay. So back when I was in art school, I'm talking about the anatomy of the country, right? I was back in, in art school, and, and we had to learn how to draw uh, the skeleton proceeding from the, the bones and down to the you know muscles, and we just we had to do all that stuff. Um, all the connecting tissues, the blood vessels, the nerves, and you know, like the backbones connected to the hip. Um, right? And my professor, I remember he said to me, he goes, um, you know, I don't really care if you, you learn all the proper names, as long as you understand what they do. Well, he shouldn't have told me that, because you know, I went with it. I didn't start learning all the names. Well, I don't want to memorize all this stuff. And like, all I want to know is how to draw better, you know? But my, my friend, um, Dr. Michelle, she's 
just telling me how when she was in medical school and, and um, she had to um, take a cadaver right down to the, you know the bone and stuff and and I was offered to do this as well it's back in college and I had a lot of medical student friends and stuff and so I got to go to things I probably shouldn't have been allowed to go to and, and I, I couldn't handle the cadaver thing you know like I opened the door to go in and went wrong place not to me, no thanks, you know. And then my part of my mind's going, yeah, but you know, like Da Vinci did that stuff, you know, and um, all the, a lot of artists that I really admired, uh, George Stubbs, and he took a whole host of part like that. But it wasn't for me. But um, it did occur to me, you know, talking with Dr. Michelle was, you know, where does the Holy Spirit reside in a person? Where in the body does the Holy Spirit dwell? Now, we all know about the brain inside our head. And again, most of people don't understand that your heart has a brain inside it as well. Science demonstrates that your heart's like its own independent nervous system. It's, got, it's a really complex system. It's basically made up of a collection of nerves. And um, do you know what nerves look like? They're kind of like white fiberish bundles of fibers that transmit um, sensations to the brain's spinal cord. I think that's probably where they got the idea for fiber optics. Can't come from someplace, right? Mm -hmm. So this is connecting to all the muscles and the organs, and you've got like hundreds of billions of nerves in, in your brain. Billions and billions, right? And, and your heart's got like 40,000 neurons in it, so it's like a, it's like a mini brain. And, it, and then we got something called the, the prefrontal cortex, and that's where your free will hangs out. So your free will is part of that decision-making. You know, remember your free will, you can accept or reject an idea. And uh, so your prefrontal cortex, it, it helps with your rational decision-making. So that it works through your, with, it's, it works with emotions. We're very emotional people, unless you're English, then you're supposed to be very stoic. <laughs> we don't like to show emotion. We have a stiff upper lip, right? But um, aside from that, so now we got this thing called the, the amygdala. Um, you call it the amygdala. I call it the amygdala. I get it confused sometimes now. I don't know what I call it anymore. But it's a, an almond sort of structure, um, almond sized shot in your brain, stores all your emotional perceptions. So inside the, the amygdala, where you, you, it's where you, the entire library of your life is kept. Does anybody ever hear like people having a near death experience and they go, and I saw my entire life just flash before me. I mean, how is that possible? Your entire life? You saw images from your entire life in seconds? Well, with God, all things are possible. So the mind, the body, the spirit, the soul connection, they're inseparable. They're all releasing you know, chemicals and, and they're stimulating emotions. You're probably having a few emotions right now. At least some. And... Um, these are all inseparable. We've got, we got to see how these all kind of work together. So your heart brain literally advises your free will and your prefrontal cortex what to do. So it's proving that you know, the real intelligence falls behind um, intuitive thoughts and feelings that you experience. You know, humans, we've got like, we hear about the five senses, right? What do you get? Taste and sight and smell and touch and and hearing, but there's more. I mean, what about temperature, um, pain? They don't have that in there, pain. What, what, I got some phantom pain, you know, somebody's talking about that. We know it's a spirit behind pain. Um, body awareness, balance, I mean, those, we've got all kinds of senses. Well, I don't want to go into the air right now, but just trust me on it. So we've got this marvelous connection with the supernatural. We've got the holy guidebook to the supernatural. We call it the Bible. John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. So what constitutes a sense seems to be a matter of some ongoing debate. Um, it, it's, when, when I was in college, I remember um, I had um, friends that were philosophy students. You know, they were debating what a window is. They couldn't define a window. They were, they were spending weeks trying to define a window. And, and so, you know, I would try to like simplistically say, well, it's, you know, it's glass and 
Or what if it's not a glass? You know, and, I mean, it goes on and on. So you, you can't you try it. See, you'll have a hard time to find in a window. So you, you've got this mini brain in your heart. It functions like a conscience, right? So where am I going with this? Back in, 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 in 1 Kings 19, we read about the still, small voice. We, we sang about it this morning, you know, that, that voice that, that guides us on. 1 Kings 19 um, starts at verse 11. It says, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind rent the mountains and baked in pieces the rocks before the Lord, and, and the Lord was with, not with in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard that he wrapped his face in the mantle, went out, and stood by the entering of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him that said, What thou hear, Elijah? So, see, our heart brain is connected with that still small voice right so many of us if we listen we're aware of that gentle voice it's nudging us to do the right direction right it's going to nudge us along it's going to give us warnings and we best pay attention to so how many of you have had experiences where you felt the lord saying the holy spirit saying don't do that and you did it anyways yeah. Or, you, you know, he said, no, turn here and do that. And, and you did that, and, and you got blessed. And he went, oh, that was God. I, I, I remember, I don't want to take too long. I was asked to speak on the, being the artist, right? I was asked to speak on the prophetic arts for a big meeting in Texas, um, and a big church gathering. And, and I got up there, and I prepared this message. I worked on it for like a couple months. And it was a really good message, and I didn't ever get to give it. Because as soon as I got up there, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, they might be spirit-filled believers in front of you, but those people over there got unforgiveness, and that one over there's got envy and jealousy, and they got bitterness. And, and I went, oh, why do you do this to me? I'm standing in front of thousands of people, and you're doing this to me. Why are you doing this to me? I went, okay, in case that's God, I better check this out. So I kind of threw out a little fleece, and I went, that was God. Oh, my God. So I, I changed totally, and I just started talking about that stuff, and then it was like this amazing, and I saw the organizers walking back and forth, like really upset, like, what's he doing? What's he, he's not even talking about art. And then it was like this great revival happened. People were weeping at the altar and getting saved, and it was incredible. People were getting restored and healed, and the organizers came up and said, we're so glad you listened to the Lord and not us. So... We just got to learn to listen. Now, in Psalm 37, 23, says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So does this mean if you're an evil man that you're on your own? Or worse? You got the devil directing your steps? Think about it. Just saying. So it seems that that voice, the Holy Spirit, our heart brain, and I'm not preaching this as doctrine, but it's just, you know, from personal observation, from scientific study, the function of the heart brain sees the Holy Spirit speaks to us where? In our heart. And so again, your heart literally advises your free will on what to do with what thoughts in your mind help you make the right decisions. As you're about to make a decision, your free will is also there and does a feedback loop which goes to your heart and advises you, you know, accept that thought or reject that thought. So a feedback loop is basically like the first system um, influences the second system and the second system influences the first system and sometimes those things don't work right like we experienced this morning I, I was trying to make a loop with my guitar and, 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 and something else happened I still have no idea how that happened but it was rather noisy so um, you know first there was a mountain then there is no mountain then there is okay um, Jesus says He's going to give us supernatural peace, right? My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the will giveth, give I unto you, but not your. What be troubled? Let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. So if your mind is calm and you're at peace, and I dare say it's much easier to hear the voice of the Lord and do what's right when you're in peace than when you're stressing out. When you're stressing out, you're not listening to God. So when you find yourself agitated, when you find yourself entertaining a place where 
things seem chaotic and then you're getting fearful and you're getting angry and you're anxious and thoughts are going back and forth those poisonous memory trees are they're like um, they're like reactivating all the places you ever been in a storm and, and, and things are flying like I've been in hurricanes I, I think I rode my horse in one one time <laughs> and the, the, you know, so the calm weather and I went out on a long trail ride and all of a sudden it's like this crazy storm Maybe tree limbs are flying you know people's stuff from you know their houses flying around and going, what is going on it's crazy it's like your mind that's exactly what happens right it's like it just throwing things all over the place um, and see, that's why back in England they said, uh, keep calm and carry on. Because, like, you know, you're in a war, and we're in a war every day, spiritual battle, and, and if you don't keep calm, what happens? People panic, and when they panic, they almost assuredly make the wrong decision. So, you know, we don't want to um, compromise the word of God here. And we want to constantly try to stay in a place of that supernatural peace because he says he, we can have it in the midst of all the difficulties all the troubles that are going on you can still have peace remember the scripture says I'm content in all things I've had a lot, I've had nothing but I'm still content because I know I am in Christ Right. so again your heart will advise your free will on what to do and still ultimately you know free will because you, you know God didn't make you into a robot we're, we're thinking beings right and and not every thought is your own so it seems a good idea to decide to listen to your heart because when you don't then you listen to your cardinal nature which leads you into sin ultimately for example if you're angry you got a thought it's angry like some unforgiveness maybe you're angry with yourself you did something wrong um, you know, I remember when I was on Atlantic Records, if, if I hit one wrong note, I would just be devastated. I was just like, you know, it didn't matter about the thousands of notes that I played that were right, I would just keep focusing on the one what I can't believe I hit the wrong note. Well, it happens. There's only one perfect, and we're not him. So if you're, you know, like dealing with unforgiveness, bitterness, it comes into your mind, your heart brain starts to advise you to reject that thought, and and bring it into captivity, right? Bring it into the obedience of Christ so you can be free, so you can be released from the prisons of your mind. Otherwise, those poisonous thoughts are going to be secreted into your bloodstream. Now, um, this is, I've talked about this some sure before, but when you reject an angry thought, you choose to forgive that person, you choose to forgive yourself from your heart, then your heart does something amazing. It's designed to secrete a chemical called ANF. And ANF, it, it carries the emotion, the peace, and it literally calms down your whole system. It's, it's just awesome. Lord, send some more ANF now. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, you know, again, um, Matthew 18, 35, so, like, like, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother that trespasses. So, I, I ask people sometimes, you know, like I, I've been in a situation, they go, well, God uses you in healing miracles, and, and I need one, I'm going, well, you know, other people prayed for you, why, why would it make a difference right now if I pray? You know, I mean, I had to ask questions, because sometimes they had issues that were re not resolved, and God says, you know, don't put your, you know, gift on the altar, go make your peace, and then come back, right? So if you can't, forgive you, how's he going to heal you? So this chemical called ANF that makes you feel at peace, it's very good for you, it produces health in your body, it motivates you, helps your brain to function better. And, and so if you're making a decision and you're not listening to the voice of your heart and you choose to meditate on an angry thought, you, you, you're releasing poisonous chemicals into your bloodstream. That's not good, that causes an imbalance in your whole body chemistry. So is it any wonder that so many people today are struggling with health-related issues? Because the whole world seems like they're stressing out right now. I mean, we, people are stressing out. They don't know what's going to happen in November American elections, right? Is, is, is this guy going to leave office? Is he going to stay? Is there going to be an election? If it is, you know, if, whatever way it looks like a big upheaval coming, right? Why would you stress out about that? It's in God's hands. Why not pray instead? 
thank you, Lord, for working it out. I don't know how you're going to fix it, but hey, you're our heavenly dad. You're going to fix it, right? So when you know the Holy Spirit in your heart, is there serious adverse effects on your health? Because, see, your, your, your body goes out of rhythm. Listen, your, your heart is not just a pump. It's the body's strongest acidator. It, it pulls every other organ of your body into in rhythm. Let's sing this together. Sing, I got rhythm. I got music. I got Jesus who could ask for anything more. Right? Okay. So, um, <laughs> so basically, being in peace means health, and brings you know. It, otherwise, being in chaos means this is this ease. You're not comfortable, and that eventually becomes sicknesses and diseases. And then we see in Second Corinthians ten five, for the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the warfare is not, it's not the physical flesh, right, and blood, but uh, this is mighty overthrowing those destructive strongholds. And uh, the devil's bringing them through vain imaginations. The devil's going, it might not work out. Right. Who said that? No, no, things are going bad. Go away. In the name of Jesus, I don't receive that. Right? Our holy guidebook, the supernatural, tells us we've got to be careful what we think about. So, like I've said before, why not ask for a passport? May I see a passport, please? How long are you staying? Have you got enough money to come in? Borders are a good thing, no matter what the globalists tell you. So we need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And, and it appears to me, you know, even doctors are starting to see now that the gospel is true. From a medical perspective, they're starting to see how this works. So tearing down those strongholds, you know, being a Christian means that you believe in Jesus. You believe Jesus died on the cross. He rose again. And, and that means you, you put him on the throne of your life. But it means you... The, the, the throne of your life is also connected to your free will at the front of your corpus calcium. So the Lord Jesus doesn't want to just be your savior, not just your healer. He wants you to submit all your thoughts. It says every thought. We ignore that. You got 30,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day. He said, bring them all to me. I want all of them. So when we reject a bad thought, bad information, what happens? It literally vanishes like hot air. It's just gone. You don't have to dwell on it anymore. Good memories produce health. So you want your life to change. And if you're not happy with the state of your health, or you're dealing with issues right now, um, that you want change, you're going to have to change your thinking. So what you think about takes a lot of discipline. You'd be kind of aware. I think most people would be really amazed if you realize how lazy it is, you know, most people become in their thought life. You just let any thought come wandering in your mind. And, and then we, we wonder why we, we get into trouble. Those poisonous thoughts that wander about our mind, and, and we wonder why we got sick and we have issues in our life. If we just take more control over our thought life, well, we'd be much happier and healthier. I've been studying this thing a long time. So what, what we see happening in the church, well, the church has sat back for the most part, it's taken a very passive role. It's allowed the political correctness agenda to come and hinder speaking the truth. At the same time, you know, it, it's now people are starting to get back on track. Well, that's enough. We've got to speak the gospel truth. So when we're speaking the truth, you know, thoughts are like, like wind. You know, they blow, it's, it's a breeze, and they, they, they jiggle the, the neurons and the synopsis and the memory trees, and they activate the chemicals that are being secreted. I'm thinking it's like a whole lot of shaking going on, right? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so, listen, it says, you know, feelings change. My feelings change all day long. Your feelings change all day long. But the word of God never changes. It changes us, right? Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, 
but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Right? And, and then in, in, in the New Testament, in Revelation 22.19, it says, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. So, what if you were, were able to understand and, and, and not react to harm feeling? Could we train ourselves to do the practice on not reacting straight away to the, the, all those strong emotions of the Demi de Gaulle, the library of your long term memory? We first analyze it and understand you. I'm, I'm going to analyze it with my prefrontal cortex. I'm going to, that's my rational decision maker. I'm going to listen to the still small voice, the Holy Ghost. And that emotion's good, then run with it. Hallelujah. And if it's not, cast it out. You know, for example, um, again, you know, if somebody's mistreated you, or you've mistreated yourself, again, forgive. Matthew 18, do Matthew 18. Take control of your, your mind with your free will and with the help of the Holy Spirit and reject all those poisonous thoughts and they become like hot air. The devil loses and Jesus wins. I like that arrangement. So what you think about grows the most and what you don't think about doesn't. Isn't that amazing? It's like, you know, the... the a garden, right? And right now, there's not enough water happening, you know, like people use their grass is all getting brown, right? I go, How come the weeds are still green? See, like, they're, they're strong, right? They, they're pretending to be alive, but they're dying too. So, you, you're going to fertilize and water the, the, the thoughts that you need, and it tells us how to do that in places like Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. I still remember that when I was teaching Sunday school and he had that child that came up to me and remember the, the scripture verse and said, be obnoxious for nothing. <laughs> okay, that's a good one too. It's not in the word, but I'll go with it right now. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all, supernatural peace, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So if you're going to um, have thoughts anyways, you might as well think good ones. Do yourself a favor. Remember the cartoons where you hear the, the little devil on one shoulder? <laughs> Oh, do the bad thing. And then the angel's like, no, don't do it. God wants to bless you, you know. Yep. Might as well think the good thoughts and then, you know, push those memory trees, you know, broke, healthy, lush ones. Um, you know, increasing your intelligence is appealing because uh, the more intelligent you become, the more skillful in the Word of God you become, the healthier you become the more dangerous the, the, the devil you become. Um, you know, love runs in a circular motion, right? Um, Third John 1, 2, be loved. I wish above all things that thou may prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. So the more you enjoy, you know, if you want life more enjoyable, prosper and be in health and, you know, help others. I, I, I get so many people every day contacting me and they've got all kinds of troubles. I go, well, what are you doing to help out somebody else? You know, Isaiah says, if you help other people, your own healing comes speedily. Get out of yourself. Get all your self-pity stuff and, you know, get out of it. Go help somebody else. When you help somebody else, all that a and stuff happens in your heart. You feel good about it, right? And you put on the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who has known the mind of Christ, the mind of the Lord that he may instruct them, we have the mind of Christ. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a nonconformist. Anybody noticed yet ever? I'm not going to conform to this world. I don't care. I'm going to follow Jesus. And so are you, right? That's why you're here. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which we prove it is good and acceptable, perfect will of God, right? Well, we've got lots of those scriptures going on. 
Now it tells us some crazy stuff is going on in the world. I really got to wind this up. Um, our holy guidebook, the supernatural, gives us numerous examples about demons and, and fallen angels and, and, and nasty things and trying to manipulate people and events and trying to take over the world. And you got the whole wacky Illuminati thing, you know, um, and all that stuff's happening. We need to be aware of it, but we don't have to dwell in it, right? right? Be aware of it. I mean, these are the guys that are calling good evil and evil good. This is, this is, we're watching prophecy unfold before us right now. Um, you know, somewhere, I, I figured that the devil's got brain damage. Yep. Somehow he's got brain damage, you know, he, he rebelled against the Lord and he convinced a third of the angels to, to rebel with him. And clearly, you know, they, 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 they tried to destroy everybody's bloodline so that the future Messiah Christ wouldn't be born. And it seems like they're trying to do it again. And they're going to fail again. Because whatever the devil does, God will always outmaneuver him. Amen. You have to have faith. You know, so now we're seeing all the, the transhumanist stuff and the gene splicing and genetic manipulation. And we're, we're seeing, that's why God has this account in there for us to understand Genesis 6 with the fallen angels. And, the, and I said I wouldn't talk about Nephilim, but I'm going to have to say something, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, Remember, it only takes one stone to get the job done, mm -hmm. and the devil never gets ahead again, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, the joint. Mm -hmm. So, um, Matthew 24, 24, and there shall be arise false Christ, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, and so much that even if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Yep. Okay, so British scientists have announced that um, they have the technology through micro implants that they can actually erase the concept of God in a person's life. This is where it's going, right? There's this wacky professor in Oxford University. Um, he's trying to play the role of God. A number, I mean, there's a number of wacky scientists that are trying to play the role of God right now, creating artificial life that would have never existed otherwise, right? Um, so however this is going to play out, um, Let's just face the fact, I don't get into it. The, the basic thing is, you know, like the whole Vatican, the NASA thing, they're preparing the world for something. And we don't want to be caught off guard. We want to understand what's happening. Um, they're, they're trying to bring something unimaginable here. They're trying to usher in all this darkness. And, and the, the darker it gets, the lighter we're going to shine. Do you ever notice when, when you, you know, you're in darkness and you light a, like a candle? I mean, it's, it's really, really bright. So all of you, let your light shine. That's what I'm encouraging you to do. It says in Matthew 13, 15, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes leave closed. And he said, any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Amen. So if we're going to keep studying... And understand this, you know, again, you know, if 98%, which is what the DVD talks about, if 98% of sickness and disease are the result of our thought life, then 98% of sickness and disease can be healed by understanding how to take your thoughts captive to the Lord so you produce, you know, good chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, and dolphins, and all that sort of stuff. Um, well, I mean, we need like to make room here for Stephanie to come up and take this on um, I'll, you know th this, there's a lot of really good things you can do to, to motivate um, like more dopamine, studies on rats show that with low levels of dopamine um, they'll just opt for the, the, the easier option you know, here's some food but if you want the good food you're going to have to go through this whole big maze and the, the, the rats with the low levels of dopamine they go, I'll just take the easy way I'll, just, I'll, I'll eat less so, you know, do things that boost your dopamine and serotonin levels. You can do this. If you understand how it works, and I'll talk about it next time more. But um, anyways, let's just pray, yes. because it's always the best thing to do. Yeah. And, um, it, it just amazes me. Like, you, I, I was hearing last night about a, um, a certain performer in Christian music world, 
and he'd go out and give these very disjointed um, messages and then do an altar call and lots of people would get saved. So, you know, God's going to use anything. He's a donkey to, to speak. He can use any of us. Amen? Amen? So let's pray together. We just thank you, Father God. Let's just say that. Say, Father God, we just praise you, your holy name. We worship you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace towards us. And we just thank you, Father God, for America, for its independence, and that you're doing a mighty work here, to thwart all the terrorist schemes, all the the evildoers. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for doing creative healings and cures and miracles. And I thank you for granting us wisdom and courage in these lost days and power of the supernatural. That those signs and those wonders, those healings and those miracles follow us. In the almighty name of Jesus. Amen and hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So I just thank you, Father God, as one of your representatives. I just pray for blessings right now, right here. Thank you, Father God, that anybody who's listened to this, anybody here, that whatever issues you're dealing with, we just thank you, Lord, for you coming and resolving them, for deaf ears to open and blind eyes to see, and hearts to be converted. I thank you, Father God, diseases just simply disappear out of anybody that's hearing the sound of my voice, that you speak through us. I thank you, Father God, for whatever needs anybody here, if it's emotional or spiritual or financial, thank you for meeting our needs. As you said, you would provide all our needs. So we're trusting you as your word. We worship you now in the almighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen and hallelujah. Amen and hallelujah. Sister Stephanie, what do you want to do?